Good afternoon, one and all. Welcome back to the session titled The Emergent. Residual, Dominant, and The Emergent. The cultural theorist Raymond Williams said that at any point in time, um, in describing a cultural system, we see fragments of the residual and fragments of the emergent in the midst of the dominant. I'm very happy to be here to introduce to you, for those who haven't heard about it, IPS PRISM, which was a project that we conceptualized in November 2011 after the two landmark political events of the year, and also in consideration of the fact that we are moving towards the 25th anniversary of the Institute of Policy Studies, and later the 50th anniversary, the 50th birthday of Singapore in 2015. So to get ready for the future, we threw ourselves this task to engage the public on this question. How will we govern ourselves in 2022? As my director, sort of, Pacha Lobang, two election cycles from now, and the current sitting prime minister had said uh, that he would be standing down in about 2021. So please turn your eyes over to the video screens where we will, give, we will take you on a nine minute tour of a year's work called the IPS PRISM. And we're very pleased to have many participants of IPS PRISM here. And I hope that the video you feel does justice to all the hard work that you've done. You've uh, journeyed with us over the year and uh, we hope that you'll enjoy it. So everyone, to the videos please. I think Singapore is at a stage where we are re-examining really quite critical big questions about ourselves, you know, who we are, what our identity is, and how we govern ourselves. Well, this is what think tanks ought to do. Try and understand our current political landscape, consider what might be our chief challenges in the years to come, and how we might govern ourselves in responding to these challenges. We knew we wanted to do a scenario planning process around the question of how we govern ourselves in 10 years' time which would engage the public. We applied scenario planning methodology in quite an intentional way because we thought that it would be an inclusive process. It allowed us to include perspectives from multiple sectors. And we also thought that the focus on the future would be useful. To involve seven sector workshops of 140 people, you never quite know what to expect. So I think the first challenge for us was to be able to frame these what we call sectors or communities of people who we'd like to involve in the process. What we were asking them was what are the most plausible yet challenging stories of Singapore in 2022 that we could bring to the next group and then for the next group to do the same. Now, not that we want people to deliberately disagree, but it was important in the process to challenge the orthodoxies. Things that the community don't question, things that Singapore don't question. When you speak about allows us make choices about distribution. Who is that us? The definition of who's in and who's out is contested even in the first place. That means an LGBT movement might feel that they're in, but say conservative or religious organizations might think they're out. It's more like in, uh, the individual is paramount versus some notion of being fair. But then we of course will continue to contest it because inevitably there will be people excluded even from the league. Well, facilitation is not always about bringing people together, but about creating a container within which disagreement can coexist. The second and probably most challenging of the design issues was how do we come together as a, a larger group to have a conversation around what the final scenarios should look like. Uh, that was the final workshop. So what we did was we got the group to vote. I, I felt uh, our team solution um, Kind of, kind of hit the nail on on the head in terms of what was required, but it was uh, we, we lost by a small margin. Uh, this 28, 25, and 19. The process was a bit confusing because we had three options to choose from, uh, and some of us tried to change it in terms of asking for you know a runoff between the uh, top two, uh, but then that's democracy for you, right? <laughs> you go with the majority flow. No, there was drama along the way, and I think that that should be the only way. You know, if it had been too easy for us to converge, I think it would have meant that we hadn't experimented very much with the potential um, range of scenarios that were out there. 
We knew we wanted to have an exhibition of some kind to communicate the scenarios to a wider public. So we turned abstract and fairly analytical scenarios into an immersive arts experience. I've always believed that the best way to communicate the future is to have people live in it. So we came up with this idea, can we create an incomplete artwork that must be completed by the audience? Audience have to constantly ask themselves, what's the future going to be like? The second question is, what kind of government do you want? And the third question is, what kind of role do you want to play in governance? One of the main portals that the audience must go through is the useless exhibition. In this portal, you have to consider what is useful now may be useless in the year 2022. That choice becomes very important because with that choice, you are deciding for yourself what are the values, what are the things that you still want to keep in Singapore. That is our vision for the future. The second portal is to ask themselves what are the modern politicians and modern people they want to be. What kind of attributes they want for our future politicians. As well as attributes that they want for themselves as they move into the year 2022. Chit chop chop chop. You know, we wanted just by the name itself to give people this sense that it was going to be casual. We only allowed our guests 10 minutes for a presentation, after which everybody could jump into the fray and start having a robust discussion future screens, tomorrow scenes, ideas. We wanted the audience to put themselves in the shoes of what the TV viewers of 2022 might watch. And packing ideas about national conscription, about seniors. What if those were the new, new norms of 2022? Sing Along Song is a portal whereby audience participate in our national pastime, singing. Here we use three very familiar national songs. We rewrite the lyrics according to the three scenarios that the IPS has given to us. Now the first song is of course, is going to be about uh, seeing a store. It's all about wealth. It's all about materialistic things, okay? Believing the fact that, you know, the more you have, the happier you'll be. We are happy workers, you and I. What we are is what we buy. Count on us to want the very best, especially from the West. Sing a give. Right, it's about what the government gives you. Now we're home, finally. It's not about the money. Wiki City, okay, where we feel what if the government wasn't enough? And therefore, we want to take things into our own hands. The people, the power to the people. Everybody now. I will sing a girl on our own way. Through the singing, they start to reflect which scenario speaks to them. The other portal is the Forum Theatre play, Wouldn't It Be Nice? In this play, we have Singaporeans facing a major crisis in the year 2022. That we should be working together. Oh, no wonder I hear about people clashing with police. Hey, we are doing it peacefully. Hey, okay? hey, 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 the audience will come up and replace this character and try to solve the crisis reflecting the kind of values that they want in terms of governance in the future. They managed to try and transport us into a crisis situation where the raw issues will emerge. Since everybody had good intentions, but if everybody did the things according to what they thought was right, then somehow or other the whole thing may not turn out right. Uh, it was tough. <laughs> Actually, I felt very lost. Um, it didn't really go out the way I wanted it to be because it can't help everyone. Definitely, I think I learned something new. And I think it, it helps people to break off from their comfort zone. I was quite surprised actually that Singaporeans were actually quite forthcoming. But it's vibrant and it's open and it's uh, spontaneous and it's different. It's not filtered, it's natural. And I think that's wonderful. I think the best thing about it is that they don't all agree. I cannot fully endorse what Nick's action are. But likewise, I cannot see a way through when the government has lost the trust of the people. The IPS PRISM survey is uh, what participants encounter towards the end of their journey. And really, it's a way of um, capturing what the audience you know, feel and what they're thinking about their values, about governance in Singapore. 
And I mean, apart from the survey and this formal piece of research, I think one of the great values of this kind of work also is that people who come to the space actually interact with one another and are already giving their views to one another and there's healthy dialogue and discussion happening there and that also is a very rich form of research. So we have both. When we hear views that are different from our own, our instinctive reaction is just to um, push it away or just ignore it or worse still, maybe castigate it and, and mock it. Um, and I don't think that's healthy for society. I think we need to be able to have uh, more platforms where we come and be genuine about listening to someone else's point of view, even if we disagree with them. Uh, PRISM tried to serve such a purpose, and I think uh, we're going to need more of that in the future. And if a me the measure of success is the, the amount of discussion it generates, I think the project succeeded. You know? uh, people talked about the future. They did, in fact, do what uh, we meant them to do, which was to pause and ponder uh, their future as citizens, as, as citizens in a representative democracy. Thank you. We are very grateful to the facilitators, the creative talent, the participants, and especially the members of public who took the time to create IPS PRISM. It is my duty to share with you the findings of the IPS PRISM survey, which serves, we hope, to um, indicate, signpost, the weak signals that people are trying to indicate about how they feel, um, we should go on as a country. So now to the shape of things to come, what are the new meanings, what are the values that will define governance in 2022? The objective of the survey was this, to complement the other output of the IPS prism, which I'm sure you saw outside, the set of scenarios, that the survey would provide us with a values map. We asked members of public who came to the immersive arts experience, the IAE, this question. Tell us a story about what your life might be in 10 years' time. What I'm going to share with you is the methodology, then the profile of the respondents of the stories, and then I'll give you the findings uh, according to these headers. What do they, would they define as good governance? Who should provide the basics in life and to whom? What role should the government play in 2022? What is the value of the vote? And finally, I'll give you a, a, a sort of flavor of what they said about leadership and where it should arise from when we discuss governance in 10 years' time. First, to the methodology, what we did was not your usual quantitative uh, social survey. We used a method called narrative capture. As I said, we asked people to share with us a story about life 10 years from now, and then we asked them to answer a set of questions which would help us to uh, grasp the meaning that they've given to their stories and what really is important to them in that context. We collected 600 responses, primarily of people who viewed the IAE, but about a tenth of them responded nevertheless, even, even though they didn't view the IAE. We've kept those responses in. We actually polled everybody. Uh, at, at the start, we were only able to poll people above 21, 21 and above, but then gradually we were able to invite people who are younger than that to join in. We extended the deadline twice and the final deadline uh, was 14th of December. So this survey was collected from the start of the IAE, which was the 8th uh, of November to the 14th of December. And we're very clear that this is not uh, a scientific random sample of Singaporeans um, it, the findings are not generalizable to Singaporeans. What they speak of are the values that lie behind uh, the, the kind of um, people who came, the values that drive the people who came to the IPS prism. 
this is what they saw when they uh, played on our survey. They actually had to uh, share a story and then mark out their position on a triad where there were three answer options. So in the case of the first question, in your story in 2022, tell us uh, your answer to this. I judge the government by whether it delivers economic growth, improves the well-being of people, or gives people the freedom to do what they want. Most of these answer options were to, uh, designed to resonate with the driving forces and the scenarios of IPS PRISM, which you can see outside, and in the booklets on your table. If they went online, this is what they would see, and they would place the marker uh, anywhere on that triangle to reflect their views. Now to who responded. This is the profile of our respondents. There's a preponderance of young people, and certainly people in um, bigger flats and in condos, private housing, more Chinese than in the census. A good number of them with no dependents, many single, and just I'm giving you the information on residency status just to emphasize the point that anyone could enter our survey, not just citizens. And this is a profile, uh, this is uh, them checking off how many elements of the IAE they viewed. Now to the profile of stories. We asked them uh, whether they thought their story had a negative or positive tone, and also how often the story they told us had occurred in their daily lives. Now to the findings. The first set of findings which responds to the question, what is good governance in your story in general? They weren't posed this question, but this is what we've tried to synthesize out of the responses. The first finding, that governance and trust in government will rest on its moral direction and how well citizens' sense of well-being is being attended to and not simply on the achievement of material goals and not the freedom to do what one wants to do. And this addresses our first and second driving forces of the PRISM scenarios. The first driving force was whether the credibility of government and the trust in government would be high or low. And the second driving force of the PRISM scenarios was whether we would become a society that's driven by a sense of moral values or by how we actually uh, create economic growth and therefore uh, the sense of value of things. Why do I, how do I come to that conclusion? These are the findings. And what I'd like to say is that the dots actually show you where people have placed themselves in that triad. And the trick is to spot the pattern, right? So what you see are the white spaces uh, along the axis between delivers economic growth and gives people the freedom to do what they want to do. What I've done is to cluster some of these responses just to show what the pattern is within that broad a uh, pattern of many more responses close to the bottom where it says improves the well-being of people. So you find many more responses uh, along that axis of delivers economic growth and well-being and well -being, and responses in the corner as well as right smack in the center. For each of these pictures, I can actually go into the dots and tell you what people are saying. So somebody in that middle cluster would say, society as a whole will be much happier and safer if everyone is doing well and living a dignified life. This is a story that participants had given to us right up front. And then they were asked to tag their stories. Okay? So we've gone behind and then looked at the stories of, of people who have placed themselves along that axis. Here's another example of um, a participant and his story or her story of somebody who placed himself or herself in that corner, improves well-being of people. People should be at the core of our society, not just another productivity statistic, caring, sharing, sensitive, strong, united, unique and belonging. 
And in our slides, which you can actually check on our website, we've, we've left the stories as they are, unedited, um, so that you hear uh, the views as intended. We also have a different set of questions which ask for opinion, not linked to stories. And in one such question, we ask, in we, we ask people to respond to this statement. In 2022, I would like Singapore to be governed by... And here you can see the sort of uh, scatter plot of responses again. And you see quite a lot of spare space on top where it says economic goals and some along common sense. We found that there are many responses right smack in the center and between moral values and common sense. And there are stories again to go with that. Now to the second section of findings, which responds to the question, who should provide the basic goods? The basic goods of healthcare, transportation, uh, housing, and such. And what we found that in the minds of the IPS PRISM participants, big government will still be in fashion a decade from now. Although there would be some space for the community to also provide these. For the IPS PRISM participants, when they were asked how it should be distributed, they said that it should be distributed on need, although some want it to be distributed equally. And I think you can hear the resonance of, um, uh, in terms of equally, the resonance to the second PRISM scenario of Singer Gives. So th this answers the third driving force of our scenarios, which poses the question in 10 years' time, how do people want to see social support and rewards distributed. So how do I come to those conclusions? I take you behind to the data. Respondents were asked to um, answer, to, to make a, place themselves on, on this triad in response to this statement. The main provider of what I need should be, and you can see a large amount of answers right at the top close to government and some towards the community. That's how we clustered it. And there are stories to go with that. The next answer we pulled into the section, the first to receive support from the government should be, and you see many, many responses at the top towards the needy and some towards the bottom where it says everyone equally. Next, we ask people to choose among three different sectors, three different segments of the population, and we say the government should help these people first. Please tell us which you would choose. So it's quite a difficult choice, but you can see that many respondents hew towards the elderly corner and move up towards the youth. And what we found was that the young respondents were just as likely to mark out the elderly receiving priority in the distribution of social support as other older respondents. So if you look at the dots, those in the 21 uh, band, the 26 to 29 band, the 30 to 34 band, are quite capable of pointing to the elderly and prioritizing them. Next, we ask people in an opinion triad, if you had $100,000 to give away for an educational scholarship, who would you give it to? And in this case, we're no longer speaking about social support or the basics. We're talking about uh, a good that usually we think of as being associated with merit, academic credentials. Our respondents fell somewhere between the two corners of someone with the most need and someone with the most potential. And this is how we clustered the responses. So I think that from the dots, we feel that there is, there's a lot more hewing towards the option of giving the scholarship to someone with the most need. Again, there are stories that you can look up later. Now to the third section of our findings. The answer to the question, how should government play its role uh, in 2022? We found that there's a strong bias towards the empowerment ethic, 
In, the, in a question, we ask people, how should government help people? Would it be to give them the fish? Would it be to give them 50% discount on the fish? Which would be subsidies of basic goods? Or would it be to teach them how to fish? This is what our prison participants said. You find that there is quite a lot of white space between help people help themselves and pay for all basic needs. And a lot more on the side, the access between help people help themselves and subsidize some of the cost of those needs. We ask people a very extreme question, what is your primary duty? And our participants said, at the end of the day, our primary duty is to take care of myself and my family. And we thought that would be of some use. In the fourth section of our findings, in stories of life in 2022, who should lead and how? These are questions of where leadership should arise. And we found that our IPS PRISM participants um, felt that leadership in governance, that means how we manage ourselves right across the country, should arise both from the government and people sectors. That's what they said. Not just from the government alone. And that government leadership is likely or perhaps should be innovative rather than be tied too much to the past. Our evidence? This is how our participants responded to the statement, in my story, the government supports new ideas regardless of the past. And you see that there's a more greater hewing to that end of the spectrum than the other, which says the government is rooted in tradition, ignoring new ideas. Next, in my story, leadership should be provided by the government or provided by the community. And you see that there's a good number of them right smack in the center. This is a little different from um, how, what we anticipated, that people might be used to having strong government leadership from, strong leadership from the government. But you see that there's a little bit of a change here. Finally, we asked people, what does the vote mean to you? And we found that people have said that the vote is important uh, in how it helps ensure that all manner of interests and concerns are represented. This is, the, this is the scattergram of how people responded, and this is how we clustered it. So you can see that a lot more responses are either at the bottom in the corner, ensures many voices are heard, or along the axis, be a check on power. So let me summarize by saying, first off, let's remember that these are views of the IPS PRISM participants, not of Singaporeans. They'd already been through the IAE and were responding to the stimulus that we'd given them. But because there's an overrepresentation of the young, I think we're quite gratified that we have the views of the young, slightly more affluent, and perhaps these would be pathfinders to governance in 2022. They are the ones who will shape the future. The main message is that they think governance should be morally centred, morally directed. The big state is still going to be in fashion, and, but it should support people in, in the way that it empowers, it teaches people how to fish. That the elderly should receive first priority for state support, though not necessarily at the expense of the youth. And that the political system, the, the ideals in their mind of the political system is that it must ensure that there is good representation of all types of interests and concerns right across society. And so finally, I think that the people who took the time to respond to our survey, obviously are a lot of uh, who don't mind being in our singer gives world, although it's a more nuanced form where we're not saying that all sorts of support should be given and to everyone equally, but certainly that there should be a, a lot of state support to help people help themselves. Thank you for your attention. And now I'm going to hand the time over to our wonderful panel, very privileged and very pleased to invite uh, the members of the elite of different sectors, not the, an elitist panel, but an elite panel uh, from three very important sectors. 
First up would be Mr. Nizam Ismail, who was previously chairman of the Association of Malay Professionals and is currently um, the chairman of the Center for Research on Islamic and Malay Affairs, which is a body within RIMA. The second speaker is a very dear friend of IPS. This is her third outing at IPS flagship conference, Ms. Sylvia Lim, who is MP of our Junit GRC, but more importantly, chairman of the Workers' Party since 2003. So very elite, elite huh? from political world. Uh, third, <laughs> not to be outdone, <laughs> Mr. Lee Su Yang, who is a member of the Legal Service Commission, and most recently, right, uh, invited and it became a member of the Council of the Presidential Advisors. Mr. Lee has been associated with IPS for a very long time. He sat on our governing board, and we're really pleased that he can be here today in his capacity as member of IPS Academic Panel. So please join me in welcoming them to give their remarks about the emergent governance in Singapore in 2022. Thank you. Very good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to be here um, to speak to you on trilogies. Um, for reasons that will become very apparent from the next slide onwards. Uh, but apart from that, the reason why I chose uh, the title trilogy is that I'm told that good movies come in trilogies. <laughs> and great ones come in double trilogies. Um, and being legally trained, I shall kick off uh, with an important caveat or disclaimer that I am neither a botanist, nor an, am I an environmentalist. Now, um, turning back to um, the IPS PRISM survey, it's interesting that uh, one of the stories told by a person, uh, when, when, when asked about what his story of good governance is, he refers back to the story of the banyan tree. And if I, if I just quickly read through this, um, he mentions that the banyan tree is pruned, and civil society grows and is embraced by the establishment. So this was his vision of governance, um, and in particular the role between government and civil society 10 years down the road. Now, for those of you not familiar with George Yeo's seminal call in 1991, George Yeo then um, had this notion that the banyan tree of the government needed to be pruned in order to allow civil society, or he used the term civic society, to grow. His idea was that to create a Singapore soul, we needed the active participation of Singaporeans, who would then not treat Singapore like just a hotel, but, also, but truly as a home. So the analogy was of a banyan tree was chosen because, uh, you know, going back to primary school science, um, the overbearing branches and roots of the banyan tree allow little to grow underneath it. So unless the banyan tree is pruned, civil society will not grow. So the thrust of my presentation is really to discuss the equilibrium point between government and civil society right now, and where we set the equilibrium point 10 years down the road. Now, this is against the backdrop of the concept of credibility in government as identified as one of the three key driving forces in the IPS uh, PRISM uh, exercise. So coming back to the tree analogy, what I hope to discuss is what kind of tree do we want and how much we should prune that tree. But before that, um, a reason why I suspect uh, why Gillian had extended the invite to myself. Um, now, Gillian touched upon the, the idea, uh, the, one of the um, interesting devices in, in the IPS prison presentation was the use of forum theater, which was incidentally banned at some point in time in Singapore, so we have progressed. Um, <laughs> It was a very interesting and clever um, uh, play or, or setting, um, and I was there purely as a participant. Now, in that play, the, the scenario was that there was an emergency situation. There were floods, there was a shortage of water supply, and we have um, a bunch of young, angry, 
but dedicated and committed Singaporeans who took matters in their hands and decided to distribute the ration of water by themselves. But along came this very uh, authoritarian, um, bureaucratic civil servant that says, stop, don't do this because I am the government, you can't do this, distribution of resources is my business, not your business. Now, uh, having been in public service previously and having developed an aversion to bureaucracy, um, so I, my immediate instinctive response was to put up my hand and very foolishly uh, participated as what is called as a spec actor. So you're a cross between a spectator and an actor. And I assumed the role of that bureaucratic civil servant, but with a twist. So I became a very permissive um, government official. <laughs> Tell me, what have you done? Um, what would you like to do? We are here to help. Help? Then you tell us, huh? what have you done? Um, How many tons of rations have you collected? Well, um, I see that there's some wonderful efforts going on here to uh, do your bit to help the people around you. So maybe if you can share with me what you do, then I can get uh, my colleagues from the government to help you with what you're trying to do. So you say you want to help us? Yes, I think it's wonderful that people like you are trying to help the community. <laughs> so you, you will uh, have concluded by now that I'm here really because I'm a bad actor, unlike my wife. <laughs> So, um, Heng Luan, who um, was called the joker in the process um, in, in forum theatre, he's like a facilitator if you like, mm -hmm. uh, very cheekily did a poll at the end of that, uh, uh, you know, very bad participation and acting on my part. Um, and also we are in the spirit of by-elections and mm. Yam Ami. Mm. And uh, so he did, you know, by a show of hands, how many people would actually vote for me as the politician or government official and yeah. here two, two goes. is a year of election uh, and he represents a certain the, the particular party in that moment <laughs> will you vote for him those who will vote for him put up your hands those who will not vote for him put up your hands <laughs> i assure you that i had a quite considerable number of hands voting for me just that it wasn't the clip but i think this brings us into the issue as to where we see the role of uh, equilibrium point between government and civil society. Interestingly, uh, we had a post-show uh, dialogue and there were some views um, by young Singaporeans that say that they still expected the state uh, to play a big role when it comes to the distribution of sources, uh, resources in an emergency, despite the fact that there were really ongoing efforts. So um, I think I mean, the, we, we can talk more about uh, my, my views as, as to why this is a case, but it could also be a case where people are not used to the idea of the state stepping back or pruning its uh, branches judiciously, or it could be really a case of my bad acting. So now turning back to the banyan tree, I think the question is whether the tree has grown dominant or domineering over the years. My view is that uh, we have unwittingly grown the banyan tree over the years. Um, put Another way, is the government still at unease over civil society participation, tolerating it at best as a necessary evil or maybe an ulcer in the mouth, let alone embracing civil society as an integral partner in good governance? I think we had some discussions about this in the morning. My personal view, having been involved in work in the community over the last uh, 15 years or more, is that civil society seems to be treated with a little bit of suspicion or cautiousness. Uh, in some conversations that I had, um, the impression I get uh, you know, from civil servants or government leaders is that there is a lingering suspicion that civil society goals may be aligned with goals that are not uh, part of that of, of the ruling party or worse still might be subjugated by the opposition. Um, in relation to the uh, VWOs, um, the, the posturing that we have seen is that it is perfectly fine if VWOs play a social, economic, municipal role, if you like, you know, running social programs, helping out those in need. But the moment you step into an advocacy arena, then you are treated a little bit differently. So the root of the matter, so pardon the tree analogy again, is what tree do we want going forward? Now, 
remember that George Yeo's comments on pruning the banyan tree were made in 1991. This was before the pervasive use of the internet. Those of you who are still uh, as old enough as I am or older will remember the days of 14.4 modems. So this was uh, that era. So the question is whether we need a different tree in this current day and age where social media is widely used. We've heard um, this morning about a growing uh, middle class, about more educated Singaporeans. So whether we, needed, we need to choose a different tree um, and even on Facebook, you know, I know that some of my friends are here today giving quick updates about what has transpired in the morning. So we live in that um, different age right now. Or do we still uh, stick to something familiar, which is a very dominant banyan tree with dominant branches and aerial roots? Um, and this looks like one of the characters in Lord of the Rings, the monster trees, uh, which is also an uh, a trilogy. Um, and I think this reflects the current state where civil society struggle to find whatever little sunshine that escapes through the branches of the banyan tree. But the risk is this, the risk is there, is, there could possibly be an emergent disconnect where Singaporeans or civil society players or active citizens feel disenchanted because they feel the absence of platforms to truly represent their interests uh, or ideals. And they feel a sense of loss of participation in setting the national agenda. Now here, um, you know, um, the AMP organized uh, at its third convention last year, and I think one of the things we gleaned from that is um, there, wa there was a proposal uh, to f um, to for certain ideas to, to venture into civil society. And the message that we got was, you know, don't do that. Um, so, and, and that lends uh, to my argument that we are still not ready to embrace civil society. Um, or should we have a giving, uh, giving tree instead? This is a different tree, uh, which stands in contradistinction to the banyan tree. Uh, this is a concept, uh, this comes from a book by uh, Shell Silverstein, uh, published in 1964, translated in more than 30 languages. It tells the story of the friendship between a boy and a tree. In his childhood, the boy climbs the branches of the trees. As he grows older, he requests to pluck the apples from the trees, which he then sells to make a profit. It's a very Singaporean boy. And as an adult, he cut down the branches of the trees to make a house. Again, property market, Singaporean boy. And years later, he comes back to the tree as an old man. There was only a stump left in the tree. And yet he found utility in the tree in being able to sit on it. Um, now this is probably a Nordic tree um, being abused by a Singapore boy, but is, is this something that Singaporeans want instead? And the modern conceptions of the tree, I think I have some missing slides here. Um, sorry, the Singapore dream. Um, it's not technically not a tree, it pretends to be a tree. Um, <laughs> It's all glossy and neon lit, strong and sound. But the only thing that grows are, are, are trees that are allowed to be grown in air-conditioned comfort. And I make no analogy with Sharon George's air-conditioned state. Um, or is this what we want? A structure being enabled by the government, but you have a mess of undergrowth there, but it is a very healthy and thriving um, undergrowth and we, we live and we accept the mess as an important part of the society that we live in. So I should go to this slide now. And just a very quick summary of uh, what uh, Julian pointed out earlier insofar it relates to government and civil society. I think we can sense uh, from these survey results, which, which I shall not go through in detail, that people want to have a sense of ownership in leadership in Singapore. And so the, this there is a tension between the concept of a banyan tree and the desire of Singaporeans, especially younger Singaporeans, to have a stake in governance in Singapore. Now, here we live in, in a world of social media. Um, unfortunately, the various noises um, or, or comments that are heard on social media are being characterized as noises. We heard that this morning uh, by Minister Lawrence Wong and, and also um, um, by, by other government officials. I think this is rather sad. Whilst participants in social media do not necessarily represent the views and aspirations of all Singaporeans, 
they represent the views of Singaporeans who take an interest in shaping Singapore's uh, destiny or future. And to ignore it um, would, in my view, be the less enlightened view when what we should be doing is to embrace it and to listen. Um, and so I end off by, by suggesting that there needs to be a recalibration of the equilibrium point between state and government. If we still accept that the tree that we want is the banyan tree, there should be more pruning of the branches and, 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 and the overarching uh, roots. Um, and really the idea is that we want to let a thousand flowers bloom. So with that, I thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first let me thank the IPS for inviting me to speak at this perspective seminar. Uh, I've give, been given 10 minutes to speak, but what I've prepared is uh, less than 10 minutes. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me because uh, I've been a bit busy lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last week, uh, I was instructed by Dr. Jillian Ko to read the PRISM report. And one interesting finding I came across was from Triad 1 on how Singaporeans judge government performance. The survey respondents were asked to choose which three deliverables the government should focus on, whether it was economic growth, giving citizens the freedom to do what they want, or improving the well-being of the people. Many of the respondents indicated that improving the well-being of the people should be the paramount task of the government. This view that economic growth should not be the end game for governments is in line with trends in other countries. Economists have also written about the side effects of high growth, called the paradox of high growth, which tends to bring about higher inequalities and other social problems. There has been a moving away from the GDP as a key indicator of progress. In 2008, Nobel laureate economist Joseph Stiglitz was asked by Nicolas Sarkozy, then French president, to come up with a better measure of social progress for France. Bhutan's happiness index is also gaining traction internationally. Sometimes this happiness index is misunderstood. It is not about emotions per se. Measures such as sustainable development, environmental conservation, and good governance are key concepts. In July 2011, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution entitled Happiness Towards a Holistic Approach to Development, which was co-sponsored by 66 countries, including Singapore. This resolution stated in its preamble that the GDP indicator by nature was not designed to and does not adequately reflect the happiness and well-being of people in a country. Many countries, member countries were then invited to pursue the elaborations of additional measures that better capture the importance of the pursuit of happiness and well-being in development with a view to guiding their public policies. Since Singapore co-sponsored the resolution, we can assume the government accepts that improving Singaporeans' well-being is a key goal. How does this affect policy making in Singapore? The devil is always in the details. Singapore life has changed a lot over a short period of time leaving many Singaporeans with a sense of insecurity and lack of place in Singapore. Urban renewal has wiped out most of our childhood memories. Singapore has also become a very unequal society. There was a recent study of world economies by Knight Frank and City Private Bank. According to their Wealth Report 2012, Singapore was listed as the world's most affluent with a GDP per capita of about $70,000 in 2010 beating Norway and the USA. It was stated that Singapore had the highest GDP per capita in 2010 globally and will likely remain at the top spot as far as 2050. This macro statistic does not mean much on the ground, where people worry about healthcare costs, housing prices, competition from foreigners in the workplace, and drastic population changes. The need for stronger safety nets looms large. So, what is the role of politicians and political parties in promoting well-being? The governing party's role is clear since it is in the position of initiating policies and implementing them. But what about other parties, such as the Workers' Party? 
Our belief is that political competition is a safeguard to improve Singaporeans' lives. We provide competition at elections, requiring the government to convince voters that it is performing. It is also our responsibility outside of election time to promote good governance. In this light, having elected opposition MPs is important in several ways. First, we assist residents in direct dealings with the government departments and can see firsthand the effects and side effects of policies. Second, we run the local town councils and can look in detail at the issues relating to town management which affect the quality of lives of many Singaporeans. On the other hand, the public also holds us accountable for our town management, which is a good thing as well. Third, we can keep the government accountable on matters of public interest by pressing for answers in Parliament with the protection of parliamentary privilege. As political parties, we need to constantly check ourselves against getting too embroiled in partisan politics to miss the wood for the trees. The wood here is the people's well-being, which should always be the guiding light in our actions. We should guard against excessive one-upmanship and ask ourselves, where lies the greater good? For instance, to demonstrate good faith, I have personally made it a point to make submissions to the government in certain policy areas which I'm familiar with ahead of any public debate. This is to enable the ministry to consider my views fully and carefully. My experience shows that the ministries were objective and even took my views on board to revise proposed legislation. Finally, let me say that going forward, the Workers' Party will continue to assist the government when we can and when it is appropriate. While as political parties, we fight electoral battles, I think it is possible to operate in a culture of mutual respect and give and take. It is possible for different political parties to coexist in this ecosystem for the benefit of all and for the survival of Singapore. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I will speak first on the PRISM work that is the subject of this conference, and then I will move on to share some of my own thoughts on emergent issues and questions. I should start by admitting that, like Nizam, I was part of the PRISM effort, but you may find this less colourful as I have no slides. But I will focus on uh, PRISM, and in particular on the driving forces that were identified as key in that project. So my exposure to scenarios approach uh, over many years has made me a supporter, and I suppose I am probably more favorably inclined than many others to the use of scenarios, but I'm also aware of their limitations. Scenarios are very logical, they depend on an understanding or interpretation of the connections, but in a complex environment where linkages are hidden, and sometimes these are hidden deliberately, and where reactions may not be fully rational, we may have to use other tools. Nevertheless, scenarios serve to challenge orthodoxies, I think this has been said more than once, and they are most useful to alert us to possible alternatives to our current view of the future. Because we very normally tend to avoid thinking of possible futures that are unpleasant or contradict our wishes. And so there's a need for such techniques to help us to consider them precisely because we wish to either avoid them, learn how to mitigate them, or adapt ourselves to these disagreeable futures. PRISM started by asking participants to put forward their aspirations. And I think we walked a very fine line because we should be very careful when we put aspirational goals into scenarios. Because we need to ensure that the scenarios are sufficiently challenging and helpful to deal with uncertainty. So the analogy is in sports, sports psychology, visualization, use looking at the way ahead to prepare the competitor to overcome the challenges to win. So aspirational goals serve as an incentive to win in the case of sports, and the scenarios approach stimulates recognition of the effort required and 
be challenges to be overcome on the way there. But events and trends are sometimes, and very often, beyond our control. So the future is not as structured as a race. And sometimes the rules or the roots of the race change. I suppose it is understandable in the context of recent political developments within Singapore that the three driving forces identified in PRISM are largely internal to Singapore and to our society. The driving force, as defined, is an uncertainty in the future that has a great influence on the way we will deal with that future. So I'll move to the first driving force. Credibility of government and its motives was identified in PRISM as the first key driving force. Now there's some question in my mind as to whether this is a simple one where we put believers at one end and doubters at the other end. I rather think that there are other dimensions to consider. So if we think about the credibility and motives of government, these are perceived through a process of communication and debate on both policies and the success of their implementation, as well as the behavior of individual leaders. We now seek a significantly higher degree of debate on issues and results, and we hold our leaders accountable to higher standards, both of transparency and behavior. And this is not only true of political leadership, but of leaders in organizations in society in general, even voluntary work organizations, charities, and now also religious groups. This observed trend to more transparency and debate is not only a question of degree, but the debate expands qualitatively to the rightful scope of government policies. And so this idea of the common good to which we all submit is contested to differentiate between private and public domains. If the credibility of government in general, not just a political party, is diminished, what will be the process then by which the community makes decisions? How would the scope for such decisions be different from today? In what areas of our lives? In what time frame will this emerge? And speaking from a business perspective, how would we take decisions in deciding to invest or take the risks in extending credit? So I think it becomes important to look at the institutional framework for government. The rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, a competent ethical civil service. I think all these and others serve to provide a framework for the community to go about necessary and important activities. The strength and the credibility of the institutions of government are important to ensure we are not solely dependent on politics to get things done. An aspect I feel that was not sufficiently explored in the three PRISM scenarios would be the difference in credibility between politics and institutions of government, and how might they become more robust and independent of each other. The issue of trust is not restricted to politics, as I have mentioned, or to people and government. The big issues of trust today also impact business through the expectations of customers, shareholders, and the community in which we live and work, and from which we draw our employees. There is a growing distrust and critique of the financial industry, for example, especially where societies have suffered from the financial crisis. This reinforces mistrust of big capitalism. In future, how might Singapore society change in this respect? And would this affect the links between government and business of today? Now, the second driving force identified in PRISM was whether the dominant values in our society would define success in terms of economic and material rewards, or in terms of social themes such as justice, liberty, and egalitarianism. Whilst this juxtaposition helps to show the tension, the position at any one time, I believe, is more complex and is a composite of the above and perhaps even more themes. The real question is a wide one. We have to admit that unique personal situations will influence our priorities as will group pressure. Is a homogenous society desirable solely for the purpose of alignment of our values? Let me here declare my own aspiration, my belief in the value of diversity. My own experience convinces me that we would be a much poorer and less rewarding society 
if we all thought the same way. I believe immigrants are important, not just as advocated for reasons of population and labour force. Diversity of thinking and values contribute to the development of our society. Conflicts may have to be resolved, things may become messy, but our society will become stronger. With immigration continuing to feature in our social landscape and our own diverse backgrounds, we should expect that dominant values will continue to be contested. But this is not a weakness. It is necessary to bring together all communities. If we believe a base for consensus has to be reached on what constitutes success, then that will necessarily include shared social values and satisfaction of material needs, and perhaps more. And I believe how we treat those who have different priorities and beliefs will distinguish us as a society, and I believe how this diversity might come to be integrated under one Singapore roof, which was not, I think, satisfactorily attempted in the scenarios, is going to be one of the keys to our future. A third driving force identified in PRISM was in deciding the distribution of help and rewards, whether policy should support the winners or the rest. The argument for the winners is not that the rest do not matter, but that the winners create a multiplier effect to benefit the common good. The argument for the rest is that people are our only resource. Developing the potential of all is needed to ensure optimal development. And immediately, I think we can see some links with the first and the second driving forces. So without going into the respective merits of these arguments, I think we see that the element of trust must come into play again, especially if we are going to say winners are expected to bring benefits to the rest. This relates not only to government, but to the relationship between different parts of our community. A complication here is identity. With whom do we individually or collectively identify? Winners or the rest? Is this dependent on the context of the question that is asked? I think our self-interest in the outcome, our own egos, and our social values will influence our approach. Objective measures to quantify indices and segment the population are not perfect, but nevertheless, I think decisions will be taken. So in a technical sense, I suppose it should be pointed out, it is not always possible to pick winners, and there is a moral hazard in winners picking winners. If we believe the future is going to be different from today, I believe there's a need to allow winners to come through, some from behind and some from places which we might never have imagined. So in conclusion, my concern with the driving forces is not with how the electorate come to agree with their elected representatives, but with how we come to agree amongst ourselves. There has hitherto been reliance on government intervention to help resolve matters. My belief is going forward, the capability of our society to resolve issues without necessarily referring them always to government will be a measure of our resilience and our health. The issue of trust within society is paramount and will continue to be important, particularly if we seek the fruits of diversity. My other concern is that major externalities may come to impact on our aspirations for governance in 2022. And in all scenario work, it is the externalities on which we need to keep an eye. We only need to look at the efforts being made to contain the financial crisis and turn around major economies to see signs of efforts by other regulators to reach into and impact other markets and societies. Singapore has been relatively insulated, but this is not to say that we will always be so. Governance may have to accommodate these external pressures. External political developments may also require reassessment of whether our position is tenable of Singapore being a friend to all countries and a threat to none. I'd like to close by saying that I'm a technology optimist, but I'm not a naive one. So the speed of change from technology depends on applications development and take up by society of its deployment. These will be as important for Singapore as any of the other externalities, 
perhaps more so given our relative affluence. Many of these will allow our people to access information, observe and communicate with other peoples and organizations in new ways that will shape our sense of trust and provide new avenues to share and collaborate. And finally, I hope this impact of technology will allow opportunities for new winners to come through from our midst. Thank you very much.